So this is what you need to tell the households. Whatever cup they are going to use, if it's one cup of bleach, then uh, have at least six cups of water. That bleach can be mixed and stayed, uh, can stay for at least 24 hours in a, con con uh, in a covered container so that they don't have to keep on wasting the bleach every other time that they are mixing. So that information needs to be very clear with the households. Then they need to clean and disinfect bathroom and toilet surfaces at least once daily. Uh, that needs to be done with the normal soap or normal detergent first and then disinfect with bleach. Okay, And of course, bleach, you've already told them on how to um, dilute that bleach. Then they need to clean the patient's clothes, bed linen, uh, bath and hand towels. They need to do that with just the normal laundry soap and water, dry salary, and ensure they do not shake soiled uh, laundry. Because when you're shaking, it's like you're also just now dispersing the, the virus around and spreading to the environment. So whoever is taking the uh, linen from the patient's room, they need to be able to just pull and, and, and put them in the maybe the right buckets or the, uh, the right laundry bags in their household. Next slide. So what else do we tell them? That they need to have heavy duty gloves and protective apron for cleaning, okay? Uh, we say that uh, we need to inform to, to involve the patient. If the patient is stable and mobile enough, they need to be able to assist even in cleaning their own rooms. Okay. So if the caregiver is the ones that uh, is the one who is used with the, the one who is cleaning, then they need to have heavy duty gloves and protective apron and use bleach, soap and bleach as well. Remember that we say that soap and water will be the one to clean the, the dirt and then followed by bleach that will be able to disinfect the surfaces. Glove mask and other waste uh, generated should be placed in a waste bin with a lid in the patient's room and then to be disposed of as infectious. Uh, remember that we have been a linkage with the community health system. So the community of volunteers ideally should be the one to be able to distribute the bin liners and ensure that they collect them as appropriate. Then uh, I hope George will be able to tell us how this will be affected across the household. Then, uh, uh, maybe missing something. Then of course we need to tell them the general things of do not share toothbrushes, cigarettes and all that. And then they need to protect other people around them. Next slide, Water. So healthcare workers uh, participating in home-based care, what do they need to do? So they need to, when they come to a household, they need to perform a risk assessment, uh, select the appropriate personal protective equipment, and follow recommendations for droplet and contact precautions. So as healthcare provider, if you are told to go to a household, then you need to perform risk assessment, ensure that you are fully done, with, with, uh, with uh, a mask, with at least with an N95. Remember, we have in a suspect case, and it could be one or maybe even two. We could have the patient, and even their contacts could also be having COVID-19. So you need to be able to provide to have the right PPE, and then ensure that you manage the contact persons who are there. Okay, who are being exposed, you need to be able to give them the right information. Remember, when you're going to that household, the first thing will be to also assess the suitability of that household to be able to host the patient there for the duration of care that they will be need. Okay, next slide. So, who is a contact person in home based care? Um, a contact person would be a healthcare associated ex anyone who has um, any person who has said any of the following. Um, healthcare associated exposure to a COVID-19 patient eh? and uh, anyone who has an exposure through working together in close proximity to a patient with COVID-19 case, any an exposure to travel with a patient who has COVID-19 and any exposure by living in the same household as a patient with COVID-19. So all those are contacts and they need to be able to be given the right information on how to take care of themselves and even how to take care of the patients. Next slide. So communication and referral. So communication will be, be, will be happening between the healthcare provider and the patient or the caregiver. Okay, so what will be happening is that the healthcare provider should be able to review the health of contacts regularly by phone. Okay, so each household will have their own designated community healthcare provider, community healthcare worker, and a healthcare provider. Okay. However, 
if feasible, then a daily visit by the healthcare provider should be able to be done, okay? Then the healthcare provider should give instructions to contacts in advance about when and where to seek care if they become ill. And again, in our nation, I think we, they need to be able to know that they can call 719 um, so that they can be directed on what to do, okay? If symptoms worsen or maybe they, they end their 14 days of isolation. Next slide. So monetary contacts for home-based care. How do you monitor? So if contacts develop symptoms, remember that we've defined contact to be even that caregiver. Anyone who is coming to contact in that patient in that household is already a contact. So how do you monitor those contacts? So if they develop symptoms, the following steps should be taken. They need to be able to no notify the receiving medical facility that a symptomatic contact will be arriving. So they need to also be taken to the hospital so that they can be tried and given the right information. So while, while they are traveling now to the hospital, they should wear a surgical mask. They should avoid taking public transport, of course, so that they don't also expose the other uh, members of public in the, in the transport or in the matatus. Then the symptomatic contact should be advised to always perform respiratory hygiene and hand hygiene, okay? Any surfaces that become soiled, then they need to be able to be decontaminated, cleaned and decontaminated. So those are the basic IPC things that you need to keep on telling the contacts, even as they come to the hospital. Next slide. So just to note, isolation should be continued for 14 days from the date the patient was assessed eligible for home base. So as we are discharging these patients, they need to know they need to isolate for 14 days. If, if they continue to have symptoms, the healthcare provider will advise accordingly. So if they continue to have a, a fever, they need to be able to be advised, do you continue staying at home? If they start uh, getting other symptoms or the symptoms worsen, then they need to be able to call 719 or notify their designated healthcare giver so that they can advise where to go, okay? Whether to go to a healthcare facility or what to do. Next. So how do we end this home-based care? We end, in case we have, we've been having asymptomatic patients, the ones without symptoms, we end the home-based care after 14 days and when they have not developed any further symptoms, okay? The symptomatic ones, we end the home-based care when there is no fever for at least 72 hours. Those are three days. And um, other symptoms have improved, like the coughing, Okay, and maybe there was a slight difficulty in breathing, so that has improved also. Maybe they had other symptoms, maybe of diarrhea or any stomach upset. And then we also end at least 17 days after, uh, after their symptoms, after the first symptoms appeared, okay? Then if testing is available, then isolation can stop after two consecutive negative tests, 24 hours apart. Okay, next slide. So the government has come up with a system of monitoring that is called the Jitenge uh, system monitoring, where healthcare providers will be able to key in the details of the patient and their temperature monitoring, and so that the government can be able to, at a glance, be able to see who is sick where and uh, how, uh, how are the patients progressing. So it's a monitoring, and I think this is where um, innovation comes in, and it's going to really help monitor patients wherever they'll be. Next slide. So this is one of the daily monitoring, and this will be patients who monitor in their temperature on a daily basis and be able to note in this uh, government tool on day one, day two, day three, until 14 days, okay? And other symptoms will be the regular symptoms for COVID-19, that will be the cough, the fever, whether there is any difficulty in breathing, whether there's any stomach upset, whether there will be any, any other symptom that may not even be uh, among the ones that has been classified as typical for COVID-19, okay? We had the other day that some patients could even be having depression. Those are things that need to be put into this uh, daily monitoring form. So this will be with the, the, the daily monitoring form will be with the caregiver. So every day they take the temperature, then they need to note there the date, the symptoms and the temperature. And then the healthcare provider will also be informed by a phone call or an SMS so that we can be able to key in into the Jitenge monitoring system. The next slide. 
So, um, though not maybe very suitable for the ones uh, who have issues like me with eyesight, but we are seeing a checklist for assessment of environmental conditions by the healthcare providers. So once you go to a household, then you have a checklist by the Ministry of Health to be able to tick in. And this checklist will talk about the infrastructure, whatever it is that you're finding in that household, okay? So the infrastructure we are talking about, um, let me just uh, do a few things. So you need to find out whether there's a functioning telephone, uh, telephone or mobile phone in that household, and then you will score. The columns will be either it's a yes or no, and then you will also give a score. Then uh, you need to find out whether there's any other means to rapidly communicate with the healthcare system, because you don't want to lose contact with the sick patients. You need to find out whether there's portable water, sewage system, cooking source, whether they're going to use any, any, any maybe uh, charcoal or whatever cooking system. It will help you to be able to assess the socioeconomic status of the patients. Then um, the other criteria will be to assess accessibility or always or stairs, whether there are stairs and whether there are any locks from inside or outside. You will also check on the accommodation. Remember that you say the patient will have their own separate bedrooms. So that needs to be checked and scored as well. You need to find out whether there is um, the resources in terms of food, whether food is available or not. Then you need to talk about the primary care and support, whether there is a designated person and whether there is any access to medical advice and care and whether the patient is going to be at risk to other patients or other people around them. So when you're going to the hospital, then you will have this checklist. Any score above 75%, the patient fits to be uh, nursed at home, okay? So any score below 75, that means that patient should go to the isolation centers in the community or in the hospital, uh, depending on how the, co the counties will start um, defining their isolation or their treatment facilities. Next slide. Then before patients take on on based care, they will have to sign a consent form that they've actually agreed, they've not been forced actually to take on based care okay so they will uh, they will sign i guess maybe having met a criteria the lab confirmed diagnosis they are asymptomatic there is absence of comorbidities there is access to suitable space for home based care so it's actually a process where you need to sit with them explain to them everything uh, the ipc measures that you need to, them to adhere to and they sign a consent they've actually agreed to be able to take up on base care and they are going to adhere to protect themselves and uh, even the ones who are around them and report to you in case there is any deterioration of uh, uh, maybe the, the, the signs and symptoms and to, to be evacuated to the next healthcare facility if need be. So what I think that should be it from my end. Next slide. That should be it. Yes, so thank you so much. So I hope I've, I've managed to explain to you in brief what on this care is how we will assess the patients who will require home-based care and what we need to tell the patients regarding home-based care. Remember that patients are different. You'll have the ones who are learned. You'll have the ones who actually need you to have a sit down totally and explain to them all these other measures. You'll have to visit the household and explain to them even, measure, even movement around the house how they need to move from the bedroom maybe to the shared facility that's the kitchen and all that. So thank you so much. And maybe it's part of the things that uh, you need to be able to talk about is also psychosocial support to the household. They need to be able to support the one in isolation. I think isolation is not a good thing, but I think for some patients who are not asymptomatic, if done well, I think it might even provide extra comfort and they might be able to get well um, from this sickness. And not forget uh, they need to be told on how to take care of themselves in terms of meals. They need to rest, take their medicine, if they're on any medicine, and they need to take a lot of uh, fruits and a balanced diet. So thank you so much, Walter. Unless there are questions, maybe we can move. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Teresia. Um, the presentation is well, well, well uh, put, and the participants are actually appreciating this excellent presentation. Uh, just a quick one. One question or two from Nicholas Kiyoko is saying, apart from the face mask and the gloves, as minimum requirement for best care, could there be other recommended PPEs? And what are and the cost of this? Is it put by the patient themselves or 
it is supported by the government. Uh, the next one is also, you said um, caregivers should wear N95, or so they're asking, is it only the N95 a must, or they can also use surgical mask? Then that is for now, you can answer those, then we can be able to go to the next presentation. Then participants continue sending your questions, we'll be able to answer again after this next presentation. Uh, Teresia, answer those two. Thank you. Um, the WHO guideline talks about a minimum of, of, of a, a mask and, and gloves, okay? And this is for the patient and for the caregivers and the people around in that household. This is the minimum. So which means they can also have many others. But remember that you've also talked about um, uh, heavy duty gloves for, for cleaning around. You've also talked about um, the, the linen that is going to be washed. So we can also have an apron so that the ones who is washing, they are protected and not having splashes. So this is just the minimum. Then we also want to be very realistic. We don't want to go into a household and find everybody in a cover or suit. Okay, it might not be very practical. So this is the minimum, a surgical mask and at least ensure that um, there are gloves around. And N95, I think that's why I even uh, highlighted it in red because um, it might not be feasible, but we could have families who can be able to afford the N95 mask. So let's also throw it out there and ensure that the contacts know that they need to have the N95 mask, okay? So that they can protect themselves from, uh, that is the droplet precaution, the maximum. Let's not deny people the information that they can actually have the N95 mask. Remember that we are dealing with patients who are in different socioeconomic status. So we are in the, if you're in the village, you may not even talk about the N95 mask, okay? If you're in Nairobi and you're talking to Rundas and the Kileleshos of this world, then you'll talk about the NN5 mask for the contacts of for the care for the um, caregivers. Thank you. Then um, what what was the other question, Walter? I think you've uh, combined the N95 and the other one. Oh, yeah. So there are more questions. You can look at the chats. You can be able to answer live, and participants will be able to uh, continue actually sending their questions. So. Thank you so much, Teresia. I think that is quite insightful and I think it is quite encouraging that health workers are willing to go the next poll step. The own best care is if we win this step, we will be proud that we will have contributed strongly. So thank you so much. Um, participants, we are now going to the next presentation, which will be done by our Apple panelist, um, George. So George, are you there? George, yes. are you there? Yes, Walter, I'm available. Yeah, Sana, you can start us off. Uh, thank you, Walter, uh, panelists, and all uh, participants. Good evening. Uh, my presentation is uh, still around uh, community health systems strengthening on home-based care. So community home-based care in Kenya uh, as, uh, has been presented by my colleague. Uh, that is slide on the title page. You have seen someone uh, presenting and uh, a case at home and uh, trying to demonstrate the, the window availability of ventilation. And the next one is a slide on uh, how to make uh, the patients should uh, cough at home to avoid infection or to the other people. Next slide. Yes. Uh, the community system preparedness to home-based care uh, on the introduction, we are saying that uh, when we are talking about strengthening community home-based care, we are uh, uh, looking at various uh, guidelines, protocols that are already in place in relationship to the current scenarios of the pandemic and how the governments are responding and bringing integration and uh, collaboration 
with all sectors, including community settings. And you realize that in Kenya today, uh, the situation of increasing or the, the spiking of the cases, like today they were 105 with uh, a death, uh, some deaths, that means there is a need to respond to the community. And so this slide is talking about uh, the introduction related to the COVID pandemic challenging health systems across the world. Community level is therefore an integral platform for primary health care to key uh, primary health care key to the delivery of services and essential public health functions and to the engagement and empowerment of communities in relationship to their health. So there's no way the community can be left behind. In Kenya, community is the first formal level of health service delivery. And therefore community health workforce are critical in the intervention of healthcare that is targeted community level. Uh, different areas even within the same geographical setting may require different approaches to designate essential services and to engage the community health workforce in maintaining these services and therefore responding directly to the COVID-19 pandemic. In most of the fatal cases, uh, so far experience have occurred in patients with advanced aid or underlying medical comorbidities. comorbidities, comorbidities. So uh, in that introduction, you can see the pictures there is alluding to uh, a community engagement, observing social distance while and, and, uh, enjoying or uh, being undertaken through a capacity development process. And uh, in the next slide, you can see the health uh, the next picture, I mean, you would see the, that is the health, uh, uh, community health workers receiving some of the PPEs to support them in the response to community uh, COVID response. Next. What are the key community health systems uh, that should be responded to through actions. One, there is need to review community health service interventions and delivery channels. What does that entail? Community service interventions, health service interventions include the workforce. Are they available in number and in capacity? Are the commodities available? Are the spaces for provision of community-based health care available and are in sound status, providing standards and quality? Are the spaces, for instance, if we talk about uh, isolation room at the community level, does the room allow for the patient and the caregiver in terms of observing risks of transmission or infection to the caregiver and other household members? Second, there is need to define non-essential services that can be interrupted or postpone and identify triggers. What are these non-essential services that can be interrupted? Community systems operate in a way that allow community members to live in harmony 
For instance, households have systems of social reciprocity, social engagement, harmony with their neighbors. The services such as worship, home-based, uh, home groupings, and any other activity, home-based care on people who are already on terminal cases in the same settings, how are these going to be addressed? And therefore, when designing the protocol on community home-based isolation, there must be consideration in mind to the non-essential services that are already existing in the community and how this is going to be an interruption or postponement of certain services and how this could trigger certain complications that may require response. Third, modify community level service delivery to avoid large gatherings of people. That is what we are saying. Development, the space must be defined in a way that it does not allow large gatherings that would actually provide a risk of exposure to infections. There is need to update registers of vulnerable households. For example, those with pregnant or lactating women, the newborns in the households, the older people who are within the same settings, the people living with disabilities or chronic conditions, they need to be uh, tracked in terms of taking their information and register to provide adequate support in terms of prevention towards the COVID-19 uh, to, to, to COVID and therefore allow these people to remain safe in the same environment or in a modified environment that would allow them to exist normally in their natural environment. And therefore, it calls for monitoring such households to ensure continuity of care and establishment of social safety nets. Next. There is also need to adapt diagnosis and treatment protocols and train and equip the community health workers to screen for COVID-19 symptoms, recognize a danger signs, and appropriately activate notification and referral pathways. There is also need to monitor the utilization of essential health services in the community by liaising regularly with the community health workforce. That implies that those who are on medication or treatment, this should be monitored to ensure that it is not interrupted, but it is uh, engaged in terms of providing the environment for continuation of the services that they receive. It requires strengthening of the COVID response in the community in the same breath that we are discussing. Next. What are the key actions for the community health workforce on the home base? care to COVID-19 response. We observe that community health workforce or workers can be leveraged to strengthen 
the COVID-19 response because one, they are trusted members of the community with important links to the facilities, leaders and organizations that are key contributors to an effective response. So community health workers in the environment are already a natural workforce on health service delivery. And therefore they are not new to other actors of health and other sectors of the economy in the community. So they are usable, they are available, they are accessible. And therefore, when they are well prepared, it becomes easier to use them as the government have made the decision this afternoon through the launch that the community health workers will be very critical in providing home-based care isolation. And this requires that they should ensure that to engage and sure to engage networks or community service providers that include NGOs, private health providers and volunteers that support response efforts in coordinated manner. So that will be one of their key actions, key roles. The other role of the community health workers here is to identify context relevant ways of the community health workers to contribute to the COVID-19 response, e.g. screening, making referrals, providing support for home care, staffing community-based isolation centers, and engaging in surveillance, contact tracing, risk communication, and community engagement. So the system, community health system, should respond to the identification of the context relevant ways that contribute to the COVID response. And those are the ways I've mentioned. Again, the system should prepare home to hospital protocols and adapt community level referral and counter referral protocols for suspected COVID cases, suspected cases of COVID-19. So the system on community-based healthcare must ensure that there is the protocols that is responsive to home, to hostel, a referral mechanism. So if referral, like the, when uh, my colleague was presenting, there is need in that protocol, the already guideline, to look at it critically and ensure that the referral mechanism is uh, seamless and uh, the workforce at that level are well prepared in terms of how, what about uh, areas like transport? Which transport is available? How do we engage transport at any time? There is a distress of call from a specific household that require referral. Who is the next on call? Is this person available? So those are some of the key uh, critical action areas to strengthen the community-based health system and community in, on home-based care. Next. In the Kenya, a uh, community-based uh, healthcare guideline, they outline uh, certain key elements. And I picked only those key two with their other sub-elements as critical, and the rest 
we can access because it is provided in the website. One of the key elements in that guideline is eligibility for home-based isolation and care. The eligibility involves confirmation uh, by lab positive as a positive case. One must be confirmed as a positive case first, or one must be a symptomatic patient with mild or symptoms of COVID-19, or one must be absent, uh, have the absence of comorbidities to be eligible for home-based isolation, or one must have access to a suitable space for isolation and care. There must be a space for a suitable isolation and care. Under the eligibility for home-based isolation, those elements are very critical. Two, uh, assessment of the feasibility of the home-based isolation and care is critical. And this involves the patient's stability to receive care at home, because one can be referred or assumed and yet the threshold of the person to be taken care at home is not observed. Two, appropriate caregivers availability. So this person should not just be abandoned under caregiver who may not provide the patient uh, care with the standards required at home. Three, uh, separate isolation spaces. That is very important because the patient should not expose the others to risk of COVID-19 uh, infections and transmission at the community level. Then access to recommended PPEs is also critical for those who are required to take care of the patients at home do they have access to the recommended PPEs? And have they been taken through the protocols, through proper training or induction, so that they understand when they talk of surgical masks and they talk of other ordinary masks, do they know the difference on what to use at what time? Do they understand the uh, process of preparing the uh, hand rub, uh, uh, the, the, the hand rub or the uh, alcohol-based sanitizers at home, or if they have them, do they understand their quality and the efficacy? Because some may be there and they are not effective for use in the same environment? Do, do they know the detergent to use and where to get them? So those are some of the very important things. And finally, there is need to understand the referral mechanism when cases indicate worsening symptoms. As I have said in the above statement, the referral mechanism pathway is very, very critical for home-based care. Uh, as we are going towards that direction. Is the government considering ambulance availability? All communities will have their own mechanisms to transfer cases from home to the next facilities available. We have to remember that care, Kenya is very diverse in its geographical setting and scope. Diversity operates in the line of the disadvantaged uh, regions uh, like the Northern Kenyan regions, the distance from the facility to the settlement sites may be a compromising situation for referral without a proper infrastructure considered in place. When we talk about instituting home-based care, 
towards COVID response. How have we addressed this? Kenya need to consider critically those areas, especially that now community transmission is one of the concerns of the government. Next slide. In conclusion, I would just uh, say that the government's guideline on community-based isolation has been launched this afternoon and is accessible in addition to the other existing protocols for home-based care and other guidelines that have been developed towards COVID-19 uh, uh, response for prevention treatment and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, care. And therefore, training of health workers and community health workers is one of the critical pathways to implement this guideline. Thank you for your time for listening. Any question? Back to you, Walter. Thank you, Joy. Thank you. Thank you. That has been very good. Um, now, um, I am also pleased to see that in the panelists, we have a team also who are here. Uh, there are many questions, so I want to hand over to my colleague, um, Kennedy, who will be able to take some of the questions. And George, you can also be able to look at the question answer and the chat boxes. You can be able to answer some of them. But I hand over to Ken uh, to be able to now moderate the next questions because there are several questions that have been asked. Thank you very much, George and uh, Teresia. Back thank you. to you. Well, thank you very much, Walter, and our able panelists, uh, Teresia and George. Uh, there are several questions that are coming our way and uh, they're very important question. And first is to understand that the Ministry of Health today launched a document on uh, what we are discussing tonight, and I believe we are very much on track. However, the questions that are being asked by the panelists are also very prudent and very pregnant that needs to be addressed. And if I start with a question from Omar, Omar is asking, and this one will go to both Teresia and George. Omar is asking that uh, if we have a case at home, a COVID positive case, and there are other in the community that need to be tested, then should they be tested in the hospitals or should they be tested in the community? And if they're going to be tested in the community, who will do this assignment? So let's start with that one as we prepare to answer also the next round of questions. Over to you, Teresia and uh, George. Um, if I go to Ken clearly, uh, the person is asking if the contact becomes um, exposed, eh? where will the test yes. be done? Should they be sent to the hospitals, to the health facilities, or should the test be done while at home? So that mm -hmm. when they fall sick, then they go to the health facilities. If the contacts fall sick, they don't need to wake up and go to the facility. They need to be able to talk to their designated healthcare provider who will give guidance on whether they need to go to the hospital to be able to get tested or whether they need to start monitoring themselves in the house. Remember that they need to talk to the healthcare provider so that um, he or she can define whether this person is actually sick of COVID or other comorbidities. It could be maybe a pneumonia, it could be a flu, it could be something else. So they need to talk to a healthcare provider who will be able to clarify for them and give them direction. But the direction will be uh, to go to the facility for testing, if not, to be able to stay in the house and start monitoring themselves with the temperature monitoring chart where they'll be able to detail their, their symptoms and the temperature and report daily. Uh, the other thing would be they could be sent to the facility for the other now comorbidities for a good um, head to toe assessment by a clinician. And that is why there is a guideline on how they will move now from the house to the hospital. They will need to use a private uh, uh, mode of transport, not use the public transport, adhere to the respiratory etiquette and cough hygiene, and uh, ensure that they have face mask and all that. So those are the guidelines. It, it, the, the first point of conduct should be the designated healthcare provider, 
who will be able now to see do I call the rapid response team to come to the, to the house to test them or not. Remember, we are looking at a time where we will have also accelerated community transmission. So will the resources be enough for the rapid response team to be able to go to every household to test them? It might not be the case. So that's why there's a designated health healthcare provider and a health care worker and, and um, CHV who will be contact people first for these households so that they can be able to tell them, is this another comorbidity or is it COVID-19 and how to go about it? Yes, uh, uh, If I may add on to that uh, question, thank you. Yes, for, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, Tracy has answered it very well. And uh, I would only add that uh, in the current guideline that was launched, um, there is, uh, I didn't see provision for home testing. And therefore, uh, it would be advisable that if one feels exposed, uh, one needs one to uh, have self-referral for uh, screening and proper testing at the facility level so that this case is not allowed to expose others who might have been still safe in the environment. Mm. So that one needs to have self-referral immediately or have contact with a healthcare provider, community health worker, or other uh, disease surveillance team, response team that their numbers are available to give advice on how to behave. But uh, that is important to note that uh, the guideline uh, may not uh, provide for home testing, but referral. Thank you. Now, still on the same, uh, now that George and uh, Teresia has responded uh, in equal measures, now uh, Christine is asking, uh, Christine Saidia is asking that uh, isolation is a medical function. Remember what the, His Excellency the President shared with the Council of Governors today. Each county has been told to set aside over 300 beds for isolation, right? Now, if isolation is a medical function in case management, so it means that this function is transferred to the household. So will the government provide medical commodities or will the community households be made to, to buy for themselves? And what is the need of having 300 isolation and still isolation is going to the households? Um, Ken, uh, if I may take that. Huh? Remember the, the time yes. that we are looking at so that uh, the government could come with this decision to start home based care is mm. an accelerated uh, community transmission. Remember, we are a country of 47 million Kenyans, or they are about, yes. Mm. And um, with what has been happening, if 60 to 70 percent of the population get COVID 19, so how many people are we talking about? Will the government be able to? Uh, give commodities to all these people for free? Will they be able to give their masks for free? Will they be able to give um, sanitizers for free? Maybe not. That is my guess. But what the home-based care will do, it will clear the isolation of the treatment facilities so that the people who really need those services can be able to utilize those services. The ones who have severe disease can be able to get treatment in the treatment facilities where the government will be able to support. Remember, the mild disease do not even require anything apart from the painkillers and maybe a few things and maybe a lot of rest and a balanced diet. That should be taken care of by the family. I think we usually say that uh, health begins with ourselves. And even the ones in the home base, if the disease becomes uh, severe, then they should be taken to a treatment facility. And that is what the government wants, so that we clear the treatment facility for the patients who rightly deserve that treatment. Thank okay, you. So, uh, I think as no. uh, she has said it, uh, yes. I, I may only add also that uh, yes, the isolation is a government function at the county level because that is the service delivery point. And so the protocol will definitely delineate very clearly 
who is to be isolated at home. And during that process, if it is a case of referral from the facility to the home, yes. I believe there will be certain level of equipment that will be provided at that household level by the level one uh, health service uh, systems. Uh, uh, what I mean is there is likely to be equipment based on the resources being mobilized and the work plans from various uh, counties that will inform the population, the, the county and the community level is and how preparedness the county is. The counties are currently preparing for community isolation centers. That is what uh, the president was talking about. The level of now uh, transferring that function at the household level is still a government function in collaboration with the community and the household. And therefore, there is going to be a common understanding on what are the basics that the household can provide based on the different scenarios, case by case. What are the basic equipment that must be provided by the government when a case is at the household level? So I don't think the people will be just dropped at the household and left there to their own people to take care of them. The reason of tracking through the community health workers and the healthcare providers is to inform the authorities that systems are functional at household level as it is linked to the health facility level. That is how I think and I believe the home-based isolation is going to operate. Okay, now, George, still on the same point of home isolation, uh, there's a question here from Omar, and I love his thinking. Omar is saying, if home isolation is in collaboration with the national government or county government, what happens to the quarantine centers? Because if you are suspected to be in contact with a COVID-19 positive person, you'll be quarantined away from your house for 14 days. So in this case, if this person who is COVID positive is brought home and we are suspected to be in contact with him and are susceptible to being infected, will we be quarantined in our houses for 14 days or will the government take us to the sites that they have designated for quarantine? And if they do, who will take care of the person who is now brought at home for home isolation? If we understand the spirit of home isolation or home-based care, then we understand that it is attempting or designed to reduce the workload. The first thing is to reduce the workload at the health facility or quarantined uh, centers where people can be taken care of at home. Two, it is supposed to reduce stigma where people feel that when they are quarantined, then they are people who are marked as having been COVID in 19 or corona virus infected. And so when people are exposed and they are well informed on home isolation and they understand the concept that it is for the benefit of them as individuals and as for the community they serve, then they understand that home isolation is one of the best approaches that will allow people, one, to know if they were exposed, how they advance to the signs and symptoms that require a hostile uh, isolation or treatment. Because when you are isolated in the hostel, that means you are under a certain level of care 
that is compromising your health systems. You cannot overcome because it is not true that everyone, you realize that only 15% of every of the people who are COVID uh, infected, only 15% require hospitalization. The rest can be taken care of at home when they are COVID-19 positive. So it requires a level of uh, awareness towards community uh, information and behavior change. So I, I don't think uh, it is something that is going to compromise the status of uh, supporting the people at home because those who are exposed are now quarantined. Uh, uh, maybe I have answered it or uh, I'm not clear, but I think the purpose of uh, isolation at home is for the benefit of the people and not for uh, stigmatization as that statement is trying to allude. Okay, thank you very much, George, but hold on, let's listen to Walter's side. Yes, Walter. Uh, thank you, Ken. Um, my thinking is it's an approach that the government is using as we go into mass testing and many people will be positive. What I would allude is home-based care is to make sure that we are not actually putting people into the 300 beds in every county, but they should be at home. Remember, the cost of COVID treatment is not as small as such, but most of them being very stable, they should be able to be handled at home. However, remember the assessment should be to see whether they are fit to stay at home or not. If the environment is not fit from the assessment of the health worker and the county response teams, then that patient goes to the isolation centers that have been identified. That one notwithstanding, we, the, the government promotes home based care to reduce the cost and to minimize. However, this is a front that we need to be very careful not to expose the caregivers and the other family members, and now we will increase the number of positives again. So if we don't get it right now, we will it will cost us in the future. So as healthy workers, let us be prepared to assist the community health systems to be able to respond and be able to actually make this a success. It is for all of us to contribute. So I look forward to a very good engagement, but I wanted to ask George one question. If a CHV, whom we are already engaged, they are already in the community health system, how do we like make sure that we are not exposing the CHVs who have comorbidities or have other conditions that could be able to risk their own lives in the process to COVID? Uh, thank you, uh, Walter. Uh, just like uh, the uh, cases that have comorbidities, uh, there will be trials in terms of understanding the health conditions of the community health volunteers or workers engaged in home-based uh, care response. And therefore, those who are uh, having underlying health conditions, they will not be allowed to be part of this process of home-based care uh, engagement, because that will expose them uh, to the risk of getting the infection and further complicated complication on their health conditions. So I think, uh, and I know, uh, according to the guidelines, which is not in the home-based care uh, protocol, that will be in a different protocol to identify who are the workforce at the community level allowed to engage in the home based care program? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. So let's take two more questions and then we shall be at looking at our time as well. Uh, the very first question is in correlation with what Walter has just asked and uh, is a similar question by Omar. And then we look at Masi's question as well. So Omar is asking, by the time we are removing these persons from the health facilities, 
to their homes for home isolation. Will the government have tested the people, the persons in this house to ascertain that they are not infected? So that if somebody is being brought into the homestead, they already know that house X has only one case of COVID. And then um, the same question from Masi Ngonga. Masi is asking, now I'll paraphrase Masi to make it a little bit interesting in the Kenyan scenario. In Kenya, we have one room, two rooms, three rooms and bungalows, right? So if most of these cases have only one bedroom or just a bed sitter, let's say the bed sitter, how do you keep a social distance while asleep with your families, right? And how safe will they be? Yes, let's start with the Omar's question that will the first home, home uh, members will be tested before isolation is done or how will it be conducted? Yes, George, what does the guideline say? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, can you realize that the guideline on home-based care was released this afternoon? Yes. And I want to promise you many people have not interacted with that policy document. But uh, yeah, very true. Uh, going forward with the uh, current engagement from the beginning of COVID-19 COVID, uh, uh, pandemic, in the country, uh, we have discussed and already engaged, and we know that uh, exposure to people who are not infected is one of the key areas where people have been uh, sensitized to understand how to behave, and that is the purpose of PPEs. And therefore, it means that when a case is being referred home or home-based care. All the contacts or the, uh, the potential contacts will be tested and proved to be free of infection before a designated caregiver is identified to take care of the case that is refined for isolation and for home-based care. That is how I understand that question. There will be need to ensure that uh, this case or contacts are secured and safe through screening to ensure that they are advised even on how to take care of themselves that now they are in the same environment that is managing uh, a positive case of COVID-19. Two, social distance at home. That is the reason why the protocol was very clear and categorical on the spaces availability. The availability of the space to host the COVID-19 cases at home is critical. And when the government inspects the home, because you, can, you will not be taken home without that environment supposed to host you inspected and approved. So there is going to be a protocol, and it is already in the checklist provided that will inform whether the environment is available to observe the social distance as required for the number of people in that space. So a one bedroom house with 10 children or even more than three people require to inform whether it is safe for, for isolation or not. So there is going to be a lot of uh, engagement to inform where to approve for home-based isolation of COVID-19 cases. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. And uh, I'm seeing 
still more questions coming. And uh, let's ma let me assure our participants that we are continuing with the same topic tomorrow, same time, from six to seven. So most of the questions are also asked here are being presented uh, in our tomorrow's webinar. So at this moment, kindly let us take um, a round of uh, final remarks. So then we can be able to close in the next three minutes, but to invite the participants to invite others for tomorrow's webinar on the same topic of home-based care in the time of COVID-19. So we'll start with George and then Teresia and then Walter and then we close. Yes, George, you are parting shots on today and uh, invite our participants for tomorrow. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Walter, for uh, 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 posting this. Uh, I would want to uh, thank the participants uh, for this particular session. And one thing I want to make an observation is that uh, like other people's worries, uh, the home-based care approach in Kenya is one of the first uh, steps in the region where many countries have not thought of. And I think we should take courage to give our contribution towards the gaps that we may find in that protocol. Two, uh, we need to also agree that the community health systems in Kenya is still not that very strong to host uh, the increasing number of cases if they are going to be coming from a specific uh, environment. And therefore, the government needed to do much more beyond the valuable protocol they have produced to find out other areas, other protocols that will bring uh, engagement and strengthening the systems to minimize exposure to those who are safe in the community settings. Thank you and I welcome you for tomorrow's webinar. Yeah. Yes, Teresia. Thank you. Um, I think mine is just to remind um, the healthcare providers we have today that um, we've done home-based care before. We have managed even um, clients with MDRTB before, and we are still managing them on home-based care, even uh, monitoring their treatment plans. Uh, we have managed uh, patients who are on, even on chemotherapy, we have managed patients uh, who are HIV and they are doing well. I think HIV program is one program that is very well managed. So this is a point where we need to be able to support the government and support our people back there with all the information on IPC, infection prevention and uh, control. When we are sent for assessment of the whole households, let's ensure that uh, we, we educate everybody in that household on how they should be able to carry themselves around. Remember but that uh, our testing, even as a country right now, is a bit low compared to other countries, maybe compared to South Africa. So we could be having asymptomatic patients still walking around. And uh, we cannot say now that everybody has been told to go home, the ones who have no symptoms, then you start stigmatizing the whole thing. L let's settle down and, and see, there could be also be a benefit in this home-based care. We could even be having people recovering even better because they are in home where their loved ones are around, they are taking full meals, they are taking a lot of rest, okay? So let's uh, embrace it and let's support um, our people. If households cannot fit on home-based care, then they should be taken to the right place because clearly we cannot all uh, fit into home-based care. There are some who will fit, there are some who will not fit. And um, as healthcare workers, let's continue believing ourselves that we can be able to beat this. I think COVID is one that has really leveraged everything in this country. It's brought everything down. Home-based care was for isolated cases and conditions before. But right now, COVID has brought us into this home-based care. It's brought the community of worker at the, at the center of everything, coordinating the households, coordinating home visits, monitoring, and all that. So let's continue supporting and I hope we'll be able to get over this. And um, even when we are managing our clients, let's sit down and see what can we do differently. Same off. Okay. 
so that uh, we are able to get more recoveries. I was happy to hear today that we had 175 discharges, recoveries. So it means as healthcare providers, there is what we are doing well. So even looking at the chat box, the question and answer, it means that all of us are really eager to know what to tell our people going forward. So thank you so much for this opportunity and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Teresia and George. Uh, over to Walter. Uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, one is to appreciate the participants and the panelists for the job well done today for attending this webinar. Uh, this is a series of 14 webinars we've had. This is the 12th one. We are remaining with two more. And uh, we appreciate you for having worked with us that journey. It's not easy. It's around one month ago. And now we are coming to a close of the 14 series. We've had another 11 before that. And I want to appreciate everyone because of the good uh, participation and the sacrifice you give to this um, uh, knowledge sharing platform. Even if we are social distancing, doing innovative ways to reach you with new knowledge. And we appreciate your sacrifice. Um, we've had, last week we had experience sharing with Chumuiya, your county Sapwani, which was very good. Um, also we share and we realize they are doing something, some things uniquely and we appreciate them. And now we are, this week we are looking at home best care today because this is a new um, front that we are supposed to really prepare because it's not been there before. But in terms of practice, home best care has been there even in the era of COVID, HIV, and therefore there is a small flip side. This is an emergency state. HIV was not that emergency. However, it was a chronic care model. So there are a few things we need to learn. And because of the launch of the guidelines, we'll be able to see as participants, if you feel that we need to repeat this, please note in the question area, we'll be able also to come back. This home-based care came in because of the comments you gave last week. And then, um, Tomorrow we are on Friday. We are experience. We are also going into experience sharing. Remember, out of the sharing last week, we realized that many many health workers are really doing so much, and we appreciate them for this. And we so to, uh, tomorrow we'll be sharing the experience of Nairobi and also um, Tadap um, Rifrichikam. What how much they are doing in that front. And so we'll be having strong panelists able to share the experience as well. And on Friday, we are looking at innovations in COVID-19. How are we innovating as health workers in responding to COVID? So feel free to attend to these webinars as we come to a close by Friday. Post your comments, give us inputs, what we can be able to redo, and we'll be able to appreciate you and the comments we will be able to take into consideration. Thank you so much, and we appreciate you for the effort and the sacrifice you give to this front in, and make sure that COVID is won. And we are sure, remain strong. We will win this war together, and we will be strong as a country, Kenya. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Walter. And uh, to me, I won't say much because uh, George Teresian Walter has mentioned a lot about uh, COVID-19 and home-based care. So join us tomorrow again. My name is Kennedy Auma, the Chair of Human Resources for Health Committee and the founder of Medical Records Institute. Stay safe, sanitize, keep your social distance, and see you tomorrow.